This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, welcome everyone to our 200th long table and uh, who better to host our 200th long table than our librarian and archivist David Hill, who is so well known among our members and a regular contributor to the ANS magazine. Uh, I think he's got a feature in every issue or at least almost every issue of the magazine and among the most popular uh, submissions to the magazine. Uh, he is, of course, the Harry W. Bass Jr. Library and Archivist at the American Numismatic Society since 2010, and he has over 25 years experience working with books and archival materials. Before the ANS, he had positions at Columbia University Archives, the Columbiana Library, the Berkshire County Historical Society in Massachusetts, the Westchester County Archives, and Iona College Library in New Rochelle, New York. So with that, I'll hand it over to David. Thank you, Nathan. I appreciate that introduction. Um, okay, let's just start right in here. Um, I really just want to start by talking about, let me see here, our, you know, this is going to be a presentation about our archival holdings and also our uh, other research materials. So I wanted to just begin by looking at this very familiar document to many of us. This is kind of the first, in, this is the first uh, invitation that went out uh, to a group of individuals um, wanting to start an antiquarian society back in 1858. And I think we, many of us have seen this document and it was signed by uh, eight or so of our uh, founding members, including Augustus Sage and Oops. Okay. And the first meetings of the American Numismatic Society took place in what has been described as uh, Augustus Sage's mother's house, basically. Um, and this is not the house, but this is a house that is in uh, the same neighborhood, uh, one of the few surviving uh, types of these two story dwellings that you uh, would have found uh, examples of at the time. And um, so this is in the same neighborhood. Uh, Augustus Sage was a coin dealer. He uh, was 16 years old at the founding of the ANS. And, you know, so we've had these kind of humble beginnings, but at this point now we have close to a thousand boxes. So these would be bankers boxes of numismatic materials that are just from the ANS's own records. So here's Augustus Sage. Uh, he, like I say, he was 16 years old when uh, the ANS was founded, but he, uh, he also died quite young. He died at 32, I think of pneumonia. This is him when he was serving as a captain in the uh, 170th New York Infantry Regiment. And one of the reasons I wanted to show Sage is because of, I wanted, frankly, to have the opportunity to show this kind of AI representation of him that somebody did online. I'm not sure where this comes from, but uh, I think maybe our curator, Jesse Kraft, uh, first showed it to me and some, somewhat creepy, you know, if, to those of us that are familiar with uh, the uh, Sage's photograph that this was taken from. Uh, one example of the kinds of correspondence that we have from the early years it comes from uh, the other numismatic societies that were also founded around the same time. And one of them was the Montreal Numismatic Society, which was started in 1862. Uh, sorry. Other numismatic societies that started at the same time were uh, one in Philadelphia in 1858 and also in Boston in 1860. Although I will say that a few years ago, um, Joel Oros uh, found reference to an earlier New York, what was called the New York Numismatic Society, not the one that came later, but one that came and 
apparently Charles Bushnell uh, talks about there being him being in a numismatic society from that came earlier, the one that was called the New York Numismatic Society. And Joel found one reference to this. And then when I did some searching, I found another reference to this. But that's all that we've seen about that. So if anybody has any information about an earlier numismatic society, because uh, until now, we consider uh, Philadelphia to have been the first uh, numismatic society created in the United States, predating us by uh, just several months. This is a photograph of uh, Alfred Sandom, who joined in 18, he joined um, the ANS in 1867 and sent in his, uh, this carte de visite of his uh, photograph. And he also wrote in a lot of uh, letters that we have um, on file. Um, he was quite active in the Montreal Numismatic Society, um, which he believe he joined in 1865. Um, at that time, the three provinces of Canada were joining together in a self-governing dominion, and he offered to send coins that he felt would no longer be circulating after that time, which is very similar to what happened in the United States in the 1850s uh, with the various laws uh, regarding coinage. It kind of um, drove a lot of all of the circulating coinage uh, up until that time, and in fact, that when they changed over to the smaller cents, this kind of spurred on the collecting of uh, the large cents. Uh, Sandum, um, he, did, he, he published the first book on Canadian coins, Coins and Tokens and Medals of Canada in 1872. Um, his medals commemorative of the visit of the HRH, uh, the Prince of Wales to Montreal is one of the first photographically illustrated numismatic books in 1871. And he founded the Canadian Antiquarian and Numismatic Journal in 1872. Uh, he wrote in in 1867, and he was very sympathetic with the ANS because the ANS's uh, American Journal of Numismatics, which had just been launched the year before, um, was already a financial failure. So he expressed sympathy over that to the ANS. Uh, Sandham died at age 72 in 1910. Uh, I wanted to talk about Sandum for one reason is that uh, w just this year we were given a uh, Sandum scrapbook, a gift of David Fanning. This was compiled between 1869 and 1895 with some of the materials dating to uh, 1862. Uh, David Fanning had this specially uh, made clamshell box made to protect it. And there's great ephemera in here. You know, you get rare circulars and booklets and photographs. Uh, I'm talking about um, generally, we have several, uh, we have a number of uh, scrapbooks from uh, numerous individuals, but we have a couple that come from uh, two of my predecessors as ANS librarian, uh, Richard Ho Lawrence and uh, Lyman Lowe. And those uh, contain all kinds of great, as I say, ephemera, there's booklets and photographs, you'll find things like wanted posters and, and even letters, so you'll find manuscript items and that sort of thing. Uh, Lyman Lowe's scrapbook, for example, contains a lot of material having to do with his writing, and I think there are cor his correspondence in there uh, when he was writing his Hard Times uh, Tokens book. And so this is a page from Sandum's scrapbook in which he pasted the society seal uh, designed, which was designed right around that time in 1867 by medalist uh, George Lovett. And it is the debut of our motto, parva ne pariant, or may the little things not perish. Also, you'll find uh, a, a few manuscript type things in this notebook, including this list of coins that uh, Sandum donated to the Montreal Society. Sandum worked to put the Montreal Society on solid footing and was primarily responsible for issuing, issuing its first medal, which commemorated its incorporation in 1870, which Sandum helped to bring about. Uh, this was intended as part of a series, so you can see here at the bottom it says Sandum series number one, but uh, this was the only one in the series. 
It was supposed to be a series on uh, the history of Montreal. And he mentioned this uh, token in a letter uh, that, that the token would be forthcoming. And he wrote an 1871 letter to the ANS saying that he would promise to send one. And uh, frankly, this token or uh, this medal could possibly been, have been from him uh, because it has one of these dummy numbers. Uh, we're not exactly sure where this um, token comes from or this medal. Uh, there's also a design, uh, so there's other manuscript materials in this um, scrapbook. So this is the design of for a medal that was unrealized for the 227th anniversary of the founding of Montreal, which possibly was intended to be um, part of the series that um, Sandham had in mind. Uh, Sandham was quite identified with numismatics in Canada, but in, a 19, in an 1875 letter, quite early in his life, he announced that he had completed his labors, he says, quote, completed his labors in the numismatic and literary line and had decided to retire from it, devoting his uh, time to other interests. He sold his coin collection in various sales, the last of which was in 1884. And he remained a corresponding member of the ANS throughout his life, but he admitted in the last letter that we have from him in 1898, he says, quote, I'm not a very active student of numismatics. He died at age 72 in 1910. So for the last few years, we've been scanning correspondence files uh, as part of our ongoing collaboration with the Newman Numismatic Portal making much of our early holdings available on the portal and internet archive. Uh, first, we did the earliest correspondence, um, basically our general correspondence file from 1858 to about 1908. And then the second stage, we did 1908 to 1932. And currently we're working on the files of Howland Wood, our curator that date from about 1913 to 1938. Uh, this is Len Augsburger, who I believe is with us here today, the project coordinator. Uh, we've been a satellite operation of the Newman Numismatic Portal since 2015. And the, uh, the whole operation is funded by the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society. And we certainly thank them uh, and Len and all involved for presenting this opportunity to make our collections available online while also physically tidying them up and making them easier to use and also as well as prolonging their life. Um, and the person that does all that is Lara Jacobs and Lara has been with us since 2017. So she's been here for about seven years now. Uh, we're closing in on 20,000 items on Internet Archive <clears throat> and the Newman portal. But these items, um, it's actually much more than that, much more scanning, because these each individual item can be a group of letters um, and, or groups of materials. Uh, I really, once again, I have to thank Lara for always alerting me and telling me about the very interesting things that we come that she comes across in the um, materials, and then many of these things find their way into articles and those sorts of things that I write. Um, <clears throat> the materials in the, in the, you can go to the Newman Numismatic portal, or you can go to Internet Archive and find the materials, but many of the things you can actually find through our catalog. So I just want to demonstrate this. I was going to do a live uh, demonstration, but I decided that was too risky. So I did kind of a little screen recording here, and I hope you can see it because it's kind of small. Okay, so there's thousands of names now associated with records in our uh, catalog donum. So you can just search. So I just kind of am searching for correspondence here in our regular ANS library catalog. Um, I think it just took a moment. Yep. And then you can see there's almost three, 4,000 results 
uh, for just correspondence. Um, so if you have a particular name of somebody you're interested in that you want to search for that's in the correspondence, um, here's some that are just for early correspondence that you can search through. Um, and I'm just going to open one up here. And I'll show you that this will link. Over here, you'll see a link to Internet Archive. And then that takes you to the correspondence on Internet Archive. So just be aware that you can go to our catalog and link to a lot of the materials that have been scanned, including auction catalogs. Um, most of our early uh, American auction catalogs have been scanned and some of the um, foreign auction catalogs and these are available um, also through our catalog, which will take you with a link directly to Internet Archive. So as I mentioned, Laura's um, often bringing me interesting things that she finds. And sometimes I'll admit it's the mundane things that capture our attention. This one we thought was interesting because it came from uh, the building I'm sitting in right now, 75 Varick Street. Um, it, this was it, in this particular letter, um, this is the Franklin Bookbinding Company and he was writing because he wanted to uh, help out in relieving the un unemployment situation by binding books. And I think he was looking for employees. Uh, but the thing that we liked, of course, was the address of the sender, which happened to be right here. And, you know, when this building was completed in 1930, it was part of a neighborhood of printing and bookbinding businesses. You know, New York City has all these kind of neighborhoods. There's a flower district and, of course, fashion district and that sort of thing. Well, this area was for bookbinding, and that's why it's thick and sturdy floors, which once held the machinery necessary for that trade, uh, would be, you know, 80 years later, perfectly suited to hold the society's coin vaults and the library's bookshelves. Another thing we found interesting was we had, did not know that Nikola Tesla was a member here until we came across this um, uh, nomination form. Another interesting letter is this one from uh, Charles uh, Ebbets, uh, Ebbets Field fame. Um, he wrote in uh, in 1919, uh, looking for he was wanted to buy four of uh, the ANS's Treaty of Versailles medals. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, that uh, the Dodgers were originally in Brooklyn, and the term uh, the uh, they were. They got their name when they got the nickname the Trolley Dodgers because of all the uh, tracks that snaked through the borough uh, in the 1890s. And so they were the home of the Brooklyn Dodgers until 1957. And uh, many fans will still not forgive Walter O'Malley for moving the Dodgers to California in 1957. I thought this one was interesting too. Uh, in 2018, the ANS acquired the inventory, the medals and dyes and galvanos and plaques and paper and digital archives of the Medallic Art Company. But the ANS has always had a connection with MAKO. Uh, in the earlier years, MAKO used to regularly supply the ANS with the medals it struck. As long as the society obtained permission from the artists or organizations um, responsible for making them. So this one came from Charles Atlas. Uh, Charles Atlas, the bodybuilder, he was actually born in Italy as Angelo Siciliano. Um, and who can forget these advertisements that were in all the comic books when I was growing up and who knows, they, I, I'm under, I understand, I believe this, uh, this program is still operational, I think this Atlas bodybuilding. Um, this is the famous 97-pound uh, weakling that, uh, and his girlfriend having sand kicked in their face by this uh, big brute. And, you know, after uh, bulking up and then decking him, the, his, uh, his girlfriend here says, um, oh, Mac, I'm, you're a real man after all. So, uh, As I say, he was born in Italy, but he moved to Brooklyn when he was about 12 years old. Uh, Atlas always said that the 97-pound weakling was him and that the beach was Coney Island. When they, when they asked Atlas for his, the whole idea here was that you were supposed to get the permission 
from the um, the basically uh, from so that you can make these metals um, the permission of the person supplying the metal um, and Atlas seemed a little confused by this he, he thought that his metal was going to go up on display so he wrote to the ANS and he said well, he was quite um, interested in coming to have it and he uh, asked if he could come up and uh, Sidney Noe said told him to come up anytime basically and this is the metal I think it had uh, something to do with uh, his program um, it was awarded for physical perfection and it's the early component of a program that he pitched for decades um, and you know it has a name for the recipients the recipient on the on the reverse um, and it's you know Charles Atlas as seen here was known as the world's most perfect man okay so you know I get my ideas not just by going through the correspondence you know these ideas of things to write about and that sort of thing I was leafing through an old um, numismatist uh, looking for something else from the 1940s and this name Parkier Carcass jumped off the page at me because I recognized this name um, this is an advertisement where someone apparently was looking for some specific gold coins to add to his collection so I looked and sure enough, of course, you know how many Parkia carcasses can there be? This was the stage name of ANS member and comedian Harry Einstein, who became quite well known on radio, television, and films. He played this character, Parkia Carcass, and he was very well known for it. And it was based on these kind of lovable Greek immigrant characters that he knew uh, growing up. Um, he is the he was the father of uh, Albert Brooks, um, the director and actor and comedian. Um, you know in film, you know he was in Taxi Driver and he made the film uh, Real Life. Um, and also he was also the father of Albert Brooks's brother, uh, uh, who played the character. Um, it was Bob Einstein. He played the character of Super Dave Osborne and also Marty Funkhauser, you may know from Curb Your Enthusiasm. I think uh, Albert Brooks was also on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Albert Brooks's original name, you know, given by his comedian father was Albert Einstein because that was, uh, you know, this is Harry Einstein. So apparently, you know, Harry thought that that, that was pretty funny. Um, but Harry Einstein was a a uh, serious collector of American coins, and he was friends with coin dealer Abe Kosoff, founder of the Professional Numismatics Guild. Um, this really wouldn't be news to anybody paying attention to numismatics in 1986, because this is the year that Bowers and Morena auctioned off the Harry Einstein collection. Uh, it was covered widely in the numismatic press and also in the New, uh, New York Times, though in that paper, the top billing went to the uh, 1804, $1804 dollar that was in the um, same sale. It wasn't Harry Einstein's um, coin, but it, it was in a different sale, it, you know, it was a different part of the catalog, and it, this was the Garrett specimen, the 1804 dollar. Uh, Harry Einstein's also kind of famous for the way he died here. Uh, in 1858, he was performing alongside other showbiz giants like Danny Thomas and George Burns and Dean Martin at the, at the Friars Club here in New York. And the event was honoring television legends Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And, you know, he, he stood up and he did his routine and it was just kind of a uh, raucous evening and everybody was laughing. And then all of a sudden he has a history of heart problem. And uh, it is said that he collapsed and slumped against uh, Milton Berle, who began crying out for a doctor. But uh, unfortunately, everybody apparently thought this was still part of the act. So um, he was taken backstage. There's stories about them actually kind of having doctors cut into him to try and uh, help him, but he died at, at 54. His collection then went into a bank vault uh, where it sat for 40 years before reappearing in the Bowers and Morena sale of 1986. Now, getting back to the correspondence, uh, sometimes the correspondence has gossip and you know people complaining about things and about their personal troubles and that sort of thing and this is the case with uh 
ANS member and sculptor Fran Francis Elwell here, uh, working on his sculpture of Dickens and Little Nell in 1890. In a 1915 letter, Elwell complained of being driven out of his profession by what he called the Morgan Bunch, um, meaning J.P. Morgan and others, specifically including the noted uh, sculptor Daniel Chester French. Um, apparently, this was at least partially because of an incident that had happened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art where he was a curator. Uh, when he clashed with the director there over the placement of a statue of a Roman emperor. And the director thundered, quote, I'm in command here. And El Elwell called him an impertinent sc scoundrel. And so he had, and then Elwell had to be removed by the police. Uh, Elwell also complains and claims that he was being poisoned at this time by his, by a servant. Um, from the beginning, the ANS has received steady inquiries from people wanting to know what their coins are worth or wanting to sell their coins. Um, you can sometimes see a, almost a hint of irritation in the replies or maybe sometimes humor. And we thought this one was pretty funny because somebody wrote in wanting to sell um, a, a medal or a medallion here. And uh, so Sydney Noe writes, uh, we should consider $100 a high valuation for this piece, and in consequence, I'm obliged to decline your tender of it at a price of $4,500. So we thought that one was pretty funny. Here's an interesting uh, letter that we received in 1919. And, you know, you look at this and it's just jam-packed with the words. You know, a lot of times this is the kind of um, letter you might expect to find in what you, I mean, it looks like a letter that you might expect to find in what might be called a crank file, generally. Um, but the good thing about this letter is that it is typed, for one thing. I just want to point out that, you know, the earliest correspondence here, and as anybody's ever had to make their way through handwritten correspondence and try and figure out what they say, we very much welcome the development of the typewriter. I mean, the typewriter was not new at this time. Um, in fact, in 1909, um, the typewriter already was, there's, there, were, there was already a, a history written of the typewriter. It was quite a lengthy book. Um, and in fact, the QWERTY keyboard that we're familiar with today debuted in, in 1874. But the writer of this was actually a serious person. The writer was Baldwin Coolidge. He was a collector with over 4,000 coins and, a profession, and he was a professional photographer. And he worked for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts for 24 years, and apparently he did some work for the ANS, but I haven't been able to figure out exactly what that is. So he was a photographer, and here's a nice photograph that he took here, show a couple, showing a couple being paddled around in the uh, famous swan boats of Boston's public garden. So in this letter, he describes a visit uh, decades earlier to the Boston home of famed coin collector Lauren Parmalee. Uh, he had been sent there by the publishers of the Century, uh, Century Dictionary to photograph coins that they were going to then use for illustrations in the dictionary, and which I did actually find those illustrations, so they did use them. Uh, Coolidge said he was surprised when he came to the address and saw a sign on the building that said brown bread and baked beans on Sunday morning. Well, Boston is called Bean Town for its one-time signature dish, and Coolidge was apparently unaware that Parmalee was indeed in the business of making baked beans. That was his business. Uh, Coolidge describes here in this letter going to Parmalee's house, and he's there to photograph these coins, and he describes what he called an ordinary commode, which in this case is a chest, and it turned out to be Parla Parmalee's safe from which he began to extract his collection, including various Lord Baltimore coins and other rare early American coins. Uh, Coolidge was at a loss exactly how to photograph these, and he was shocked when Parmalee said, just stick them to a piece of paper with wax and just take the photograph. <laughs> so in, this, in his letter, uh, he said there would not, uh, Coolidge says, quote, there would not anyone have permission to do that to any of my collection, he says. And the kind of coincidence that 
really just seems to happen to me here all the time. I happened to be, at the time we discovered this letter, working with a handful of uncatalogued photographs of Parmalee's collection that were taken for an unknown purpose. These have been acquired by the society, uh, for the society by Harry Bass in a 1995 sale uh, of the uh, bibliographic collector, Armin Champa. The, the photographs have Coolidge's stamp on them, indicating the location and the, uh, indicating his location at the time. So they, they tell us that they were made between 1887 and 1890. Uh, there are about, there are eight photographs in the lot, and but three are duplicates. So that leaves five total, which happens to be the number uh, of negatives Coolidge said that he made that day in his letter. So it's very possible that these um, five photographs are the ones that he made that day that he was describing in the letter. I will say that in that letter, he talks about sending the photographs to the ANS if I'm not mistaken. Um, but these are definitely not, any, these, these photographs were purchased at, at the Champa sale. So I'm not sure they could be the same photographs that he's talking about, but that is still a mystery, I think. Uh, one, numis, one aspect of numismatic history that is certainly not uncommon to anyone that's looked into it are the various feuds that you find in the records. And this one involved uh, B. Max Mel, the, uh, dealer. And this seen here on this great poster, uh, this is just a portion of a great colorful poster. Anytime you find anything this colorful in the archives that you can use to illustrate, you're, you're very pleased with. Um, Mel was a well-known coin dealer based in Fort Worth, Texas, and he operated for over 50 years in the first half of the 20th century. His nemesis, in this case anyway, was Abraham Atlas Levy, um, seen here on his letterhead as an in costume as Henry Hudson, a role that he played in a carnival in his hometown of Syracuse, New York. And speaking of uh, photographs on, uh, you know, I always wish that everyone put their photograph on their letterhead because we'd have a lot more, we'd know a lot uh, more people that, that we'd have photographs and we know a lot, what a lot more people look like. So this is another great photograph that Levy put on his. Uh, Levy was, he dabbled in coin and stamp sales and he maintained a friendly correspondence with the ANS. And you get the, the sense in some of his letters that he was really making to look to a lot of, looking for connections and, and at one point asking probing questions about JP Morgan's collect collecting interests, for example. The trouble seemingly began in 1915 when in a Syracuse newspaper, Levy accused Mel of uh, knowingly selling Republic of Texas banknotes, um, stolen te Republic of, te of Texas banknotes. And Levy compounded things by mailing this column that he wrote, um, calling out Mel uh, to everyone around the country and talking the matter up among dealers and collectors and that sort of thing. So a furious Mel uh, defended himself in a very detailed and long-winded circular that I always thought was kind of funny because this thing just goes on and on for six pages of text packed in there. But he says at the end, at the very end, he says, my aim in publishing this article is not intended as a reply to the Syracuse uh, expert, which is uh, Levy. Outbursts of his kind deserve and get the attention only of those of his own low turn of mind. Um, so, you know, it's kind of funny that he would go on for pages and say, well, I, this is, I'm not intending this as, a, as an answer to uh, Levy. But if you look back, um, this, things really seem to have uh, started years earlier between these two. Um, this item was published in the Numismatic Monthly. It says here 1908, but it was actually published in 1910, making it very difficult for me to find initially. Um, this, what we have here, is came from, out of our uh, correspondence files. Um, and, and what had happened here was that Mel here uh, goes after Levy in, in 1910, saying there's a few cranks who seem to take delight in annoying auction catalogs 
you know, they bid and then they return it, um, expecting a discount. This, you know, in this class of cranks is levy, uh, unreasonable dealings, uh, void of respectable consideration, informing other dealers of his unfair dealings. So, you know, Levy must have really stewed over this for years. Um, apparently what had happened was Levy bought some coin, or he, he won some coins in an auction, the coins were sent. Levy didn't like it, he sent it back. Apparently he put one of the coins up for sale and didn't pay for it. In any event, um, this really probably got under Levy's skin and um, this led to probably him coming after Mel these many years later. So, Back to 1915, Levy elevates his attack and he brings the matter before the ANS's council in 1916, charging Mel with conduct unbecoming of a member of the society. And he, and he lays out his charges against Mel in, in six points. And uh, five of them have to do with the Texas bills, but strangely one relates to Mel's sale or what, have said, what are said to be Confederate half dollars, which uh, Mel was selling for a dollar here in this advertisement. Now, anyone who knows anything about US and American coinage can tell you that Confederate half dollars are quite rare. Only four were struck as patterns and the whereabouts of only two were known at the time, one of which would enter the ANS's collection uh, a couple of years later, courtesy of J. Sanford Saltis. So the ANS and its point by point refutation of Levy uh, dismisses this this charge as absurd, um, saying here, um, it is indeed an insult to the intelligence of collectors to suppose that after reading the advertisement in question, they would be under the impression that the dealer was offering him a well-known rarity for one dollar. I will say here, though, I have only seen this uh, document in a draft, so you can see where things are crossed, crossed out here. and. Uh, I haven't seen an original or a final copy of this document. So the ANS didn't let uh, Mel fully off the hook. Um, he wrote that the ANS in kind of they went they went point by point through this whole thing. Um, and they wrote and said, we strenuously disapprove of the manner in which this whole affair has been aired by both parties to the disgust of all numismatists and to the discredit of numismatics. Uh, Levy didn't seem bothered by this and he continued to do business with the ANS and he purchased medals and books from the ANS, uh, writing, until writing in 1927, he said, not being interested anymore, I wish to resign. I get my ideas, you know, the things that interest me and maybe that I might write about, not only poking around in the archives, but also going through the um, vault and looking through the collections in the cabinets. And so one day I came across this medal for an ex uh, having to do with an award for an exhibit of photographs uh, and, and on here referring to baby patrons, which I thought baby patrons, I had to figure out what that was. But I also wondered if this medal had something to do with one of my predecessors as ANS librarian, Richard Ho Lawrence, who I knew was active in amateur uh, photographer circles in the late 19th century. Uh, and sure enough, it turns out to have been donated by his wife, Jesse, after his death. So it did indeed come from his collection. I also want to point out here that um, this is the first, I first when I was uh, writing about the, uh, on this topic, I, I was able to, for the first time, finally find a picture of Richard Ho Lawrence. It's the only picture I've found. And um, I found it on familysearch.com, which is kind of like an ancestry.com, but except it's free. And it's by the um, Church of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons put this out. And um, this I found in a passport application. There's photographs in there on passport applications. Um, we found uh, Edward Newell's wife's first, first photograph that we found. Uh, that was not found here, it was found by someone else. Um, but this is exactly where she found it on a passport application. So I thought I'm gonna check those for, uh, for Lowe. 
or for um, Richard Ho Lawrence, and sure enough, I was able to find one. Um, Lawrence was a banker. Uh, he had an interest in Roman coins. He was president of the Grolio Club, and like his uncle, he was invented, just like his uncle, uh, also the president of the Grolio Club. Um, it's possible, you know, this medal, he maybe uh, Lawrence received it as a runner up in one of the bronze categories, or uh, given his interest in numismatics and photography, photography, perhaps he simply acquired it for his collection. Um, because Lawrence was an active member of the Society of Amateur Photographers of New York, which started in 1884. Uh, the ranks of amateur photographers had grown in the latter half of the 19th century as technical advancements made it uh, simplify the process of uh, taking photographs and um, developing them. Um, and also there was a growing middle class that kind of had the leisure time to go after these hobbies and pers other pursuits. And so just like with numismatics, amateur photographers uh, associated with each other to share ideas and build collections and mount exhibits and assemble libraries and socialize. Uh, this medal here shows kind of this uh, bellows style camera. Um, the, the most well-known name associated with the group would be Alfred Stieglitz, the famous artistic photographer and husband of Georgia O'Keeffe. He joined in 1891. Uh, Richard Ho Lawrence was employed by Jacob Rees, uh, the muckraking social reformer, um, to help photograph some of the seedier areas of New York's Lower East Side uh, for his um, book, How the Other Half Lives. And, you know, it's possible that he, um, that Lawrence could be the um, photographer who took some of these more famous images like this one that Reese used in his books. Uh, this um, journal, the Amer American Amateur Photographer, was started in 1889, and Lawrence was only one of only two artists to have a photograph in the first issue. Um, this one is taken in New York Harbor from the deck of the steamship Philadelphia during the celebration of the centennial of the inauguration of George Washington. This uh, journal would be, come to be edited by Stieglitz. Stieglitz and his followers were called pictorialists and they emphasized beauty over the st strict depictions of reality. And it was uh, an idea that he then uh, promoted through the magazine. It was Kind of funny to me because uh, in the magazine it, they're always talking about uh, Stieglitz who was living in Germany at the time is it's always Herr Stieglitz this and Herr Stieglitz that but they may have been surprised to learn that Stieglitz was born in Hoboken right across the river here from us but what about these baby patrons okay so further research revealed that this was a contrivance concocted as part of an 1895 fundraiser held for the Messiah Home, an orphanage that had opened in New York City 10 years earlier. And the babies were actually children whose sponsors, uh, parents, grandparents, and that sort of thing, sent in $1 along with quality photographs taken of the child when they were under five years old. Uh, the children were then formed a league of baby patrons with their own elected baby president. Uh, these were the progeny of well-off newspaper editors and professors and bankers and that sort of thing. And this is all in quite stark contrast, you can imagine, to the orphanage's regular residents. Prizes were handed out for photographs of the most perfect, the prettiest, the brightest, and the jolliest, and the dearest babies. The, the medals were uh, awarded, uh, the medals that were awarded uh, were struck by the Gorham Manufacturing. According to one report, there were 10 in silver for the first prizes in the baby categories, and the runners-up were in bronze. Uh, the medal for the grand prize wasn't specified. Um, 
Two additional silver medals were given out for technical excellence of the photographs, and one to a professional photographer and the other to an amateur. So as I said, perhaps Lawrence got one of these or maybe he just acquired it for his collection, but I imagine they're quite rare. It doesn't seem that many were made. The New York Times covered the baby patrons uh, contest quite extensively. Um, they noted how the sponsors dressed the kids in inventive and eye-catching attire and were especially taken with this boy who made quite an impression being photographed in various women's outfits. And it says, quote, some of his prettiest poses, they reported, quote, are as little Japanese women as seen here. The ANS has a number of photography medals in its collection. And I, I like the, the combination of kind of the artistic, technical, and uh, magical elements, really, that go into some of these medals. In this allegorical scene, a woman holds up what is likely a glass plate to capture light from Apollo. And you can see that there's sunflowers that kind of accentuate this idea of the sun around the scene. Uh, glass has been used for negatives for decades by this point, but uh, film negatives had already been invented about 10 years earlier, and the two formats would continue side by side for another couple of decades. Uh, this is uh, another medal, and I, I must say this is another kind of mystery because it's clearly uh, signed here, Shadell, uh, but I tried very hard to find, I mean, there is an artist, Jules Shadell, but uh, it doesn't seem terribly likely uh, that he was the artist here. So if anybody has any clue about this medal, uh, let me know. Um, this one depicts a woman examining what is presumably a glass plate negative made uh, and a um, large bellows style camera down at her feet. This one has on its obverse a woman photographing a landscape on the banks of the Seine, uh, while the veiled camera itself is the subject of the reverse with the Cathedral of Notre Dame in the distance. In the first decades, photography was a laborious undertaking, and it would require an understanding of chemistry and, and so forth. And it would remain a hands-on process for many photographers into the 20th century, and shows a gentleman here uh, in the dark room. This medal was a prize given out by the Journal of the Amateur, the Profession and the Trade, which was first published in London in 1888. Uh, it was given as an award for the making of magic lantern slide or slides. Uh, this was a method using glass slides to project images for an audience. And it really started before photography in the 1600s and using painted images on glass to begin with, and later with photographs, a process that lasted well into the 20th century, uh, and it was only really replaced in the 1950s with film slide projection, which we're all, many of us, not all of us maybe, are familiar with, probably all of us, um, and then replaced with this, what I'm using right now, which is PowerPoint. Uh, perhaps because of traditional associations with femininity, uh, femininity and art, it seems that women, allegorical or otherwise, are often on these uh, photography medals. And it's not just fancy award and um, art medals that we have relating to photography. This token here advertises the photographic services of the Moore Brothers of Springfield, Massachusetts, and is one, only, one of only five struck in copper. Uh, these kinds of tokens have always been highly collectible, stretching back into the 19th century. And in fact, the founders of the ANS, like Augustus Sage and uh, Joseph Levick, were serious about collecting these. Uh, one of our founders, Edward Groh, donated over 5,000 of these in 1900. Uh, what I learned from a little research was that the Moore brothers had a reputation for debunking makers of uh, spirit photographs, like this one. The faked photograph is usually completed uh, when the photograph was being developed, the um, scammer would introduce a, um, a transparency and then project the image onto the, the finished product. 
uh, one charlatan exposed by uh, the Moors was hunted down and found drunk at an uptown hotel and was literally run out of town on a midnight train uh, so fast that his victim got to keep the camera that he'd left behind. Okay, I'm going to turn my attention the little time we have left here to um, expositions and the ANS's experience with a couple of them in the late 19th century. Uh, these fairs were, uh, World's Fairs, were a uh, new international forum where countries could show off and compete against each other in intellectual and artistic and industrial affairs. You know, in the mid-19th century, America was seen by the rest of the world as kind of distant and provincial and unsophisticated, really. And so this, these fairs were a good way to demonstrate that it had a lot to offer. Uh, Firms like Samuel Colt, maker of firearms, and the McCormick Harvesting Company of Chicago got a taste of international uh, recognition and found some success competing at the fairs. Uh, what is considered usually the first uh, World's Fair was held in London in 1851. Its uh, roots can be traced to the various in industrial and uh, mechanics fairs that were held in France and England. Uh, the United States had a tradition of agricultural fairs. Um, this fair in London was called the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, and it was known for its great uh, Crystal Palace, which was basically a giant greenhouse. And it was built by a horticulturist and architect, Joseph Paxton. Incidentally, being made of glass and steel didn't prevent it from burning to the ground. After the fair, the Crystal Palace uh, was taken apart and reconstructed in a different part of London, and in 1936, over 80 years after it was built, it was completely destroyed by fire. Uh, the first fair in the United States uh, is considered to be the one in 1853. It was modeled, it was in New York City, and it was modeled after the one in London. Uh, some people in some sources will say that the Philadelphia Fair is the, was the first, which was the centennial celebration in 1876. Um, You'll see a lot of sources that say that that is the first one, um, but I'm going to go with what it says in the Encyclopedia of World's Fairs and Expositions, 2008. Uh, so we're looking at the New York Fair um, in 1853. This also had a crystal, its own crystal palace. Um, it was called the Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. Um, there were plenty of numismatic items there. There were medals depicting Daniel Webster and Henry Clay, and there were gold coins and nuggets from California's recent gold rush. But of course, there were the many thousands of commemorative coins and um, award medals and souvenir tokens that emanated from fairs, uh, from all the fairs, including this one. You can see here this Ladding Observatory um, on the reverse here was the tallest structure in the city at the time. Um, and that was uh, uh, put there as part of the fair. And the Lighting Observatory burned uh, in 1856. That was made out of wood. Uh, this was the, the Crystal Palace, where you see the Lighting Observatory there behind it. Um, it's located where Bryant Park is now. Uh, if you're familiar with New York City, it's behind the library. Um, there was a, a large reservoir there. There was a, a kind of an attraction that people walked around on. Um, and that was the area where this uh, fair took place. And sure enough, this also burned down in 1858. The ANS first expressed interest in participating in a World's Fair in 1893, the famous World's Columbian Exposition uh, held to celebrate uh, and commemorate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World. Uh, it's remembered now for many things, including the debut of the Ferris wheel and the elongated souvenir coins, and for the uh, serial killer Henry Holmes, as detailed in uh, Eric Larson's Devil in the White City. Um, this is the Ferris Court of Honor, which is dominated by Daniel Chester French's Republic statue. Uh, by the way, years ago in our John Riley Jr. papers, I discovered a set of film negatives that uh, one of our early members who was responsible for building and donating our collection after his death, it came to us, 
of our East Asian coins. Uh, he had apparently basically an early um, one of the first in those first years a Kodak camera and he went around this fair and took uh, film negatives and I finally discovered what I was looking at after I was looking at these negatives for a while I finally discovered that it was from this fair. Um, of course, the ANS has a lot of uh, kind of the kind of souvenir stuff that came out of the fair, like this um, aluminum token with an encased entry ticket. Uh, also, these uh, tiny metalettes that had the Lord's Prayer on the back, a specialty of George Soley, who went around these fairs at the time, uh, creating souvenirs. He had acquired the uh, steam press that had been uh, first used at the U.S. Mint. Um, and he made these uh, souvenir coins. Uh, the ANS had hoped to elevate the state of medallic arts and coin design uh, by exhibiting at the fair and particularly contrasting uh, ancient coins and better coins with what has been come to been universally agreed upon was the st sorry state of coins uh, in, in the US at the time. But the uh, ANS ran into some red tape. They could get no answers from the organizers of the fair. So they instead decided to hold their own show in New York at its rooms here at the, the rented rooms at the Academy of Medicine building on West 43rd Street. Uh, notice of the ANS's failure to secure space at the exposition was reported in newspapers all, all around the country. And in Ro Rhode Island, they put a positive spin on it. They said, Nor New York is tickled almost to death because there is one exhibition that will not neglect Gotham for the World's Fair. The American Numismatic Society will give its exhibition in New York. The flyer for the show lists 122 coins and medals relating to Columbus from the Society's own collections, including a full set of medals and in eight different medals uh, that were done by Tiffany. Uh, they supplemented this with uh, numerous other coins, ancient and medieval and coins of the Renaissance. And the whole idea was to come and a lot of uh, US coins to commemorate um, and to honor the foundation of the United States in uh, the Republic that had been founded in the new world. Um, This ANS had its own medal, and that was this medal. It wasn't ready in time for the exhibit, uh, but the plaster models were shown. It is said that they, this was issued the day after the fair. Uh, for this fair, the ANS put together a scrapbook, um, and I, th I always thought this was kind of funny. They lovingly put this together, but a lot of these letters kind of um, sound very modern in the way that people in them are trying to get out of doing anything uh, in, on, these, uh, on the committees. You know, for example, uh, Woodbury Langdon here says, when I allowed the use of my name, it was with the distinct understanding that no work was required. Um, uh, the, the fair, it was quite something to, to look at. It must have been quite something to see, but these buildings are just kind of empty sheds that are coated with uh, basically plaster with something called staff that was all mixed together. And of course it was highly flammable. And this too burned uh, in 1894. Much of the fairgrounds was destroyed in a fire. So six years later, the society decided that it wanted to participate in another World's Fair to be held the following year in Paris in 1900. And an added benefit would be the chance to participate in the uh, International Numismatic Congress, whose um, meeting had been scheduled to coincide with the fair. It was the second conference uh, after one, the first one being held in Brussels in 1891, and it would be the first to include the ANS as a member. And this participation was the idea of George Kuntz. Kuntz had joined in 1893, and. Um, he immediately became an influential and active member of the society. He was vice president of Tiffany. He became vice president there at age 23, and he was a gemologist, and the mineral kunzite is named after him. He had joined the society, um, and he had particular interest in the redesign of US coinage. Uh, the idea for participating in this fair ran into some trouble at first because one of the members said that we could not make a credible exhibition. Uh, 
it, because the metals produced in the country could not compete with those of France in artistic merit. Um, so one of the other members decided without, uh, without disputing that, that uh, he said that the whole display would be historic and not artistic. So um, his, his argument won the day on that one. So they were able to go forward with the fair. The exhibit was first displayed at the Society's Academy of Medicine rooms and then uh, shipped off to Paris to be installed. And we have reached the our time limit here. So the end of the story is that they did participate in the fair. And got an uh, award for it. And they had the silver medal, although it was reported at first that they got the gold medal. Uh, this turned out not to be true. And um, our president, Andrew Zabriskie, was not really happy about getting the gold medal. He said, ah, I'm distinctly disappointed, but half a loaf is better than none. So that is it. Well, thank you, David. Yes. Open it up to questions. I'll just stop that screen share. Do we have any questions? You guys can either drop it in the chat or unmute yourself. I mean, I have, I mean, just you pointed out that Tesla was a member of the ANS. I did not realize this. This is the first time hearing I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any more of that? Because that just seemed to be his application form. Do we have? Um, any no, unfortunately, it? no, I went digging around to try and find anything else. In fact, the one thing I did find was several years later, one of these things where um, they they return and they go after him for um, non payment, you know, they, they <laughs> so basically, they're trying to track him down so they can get the dues. Um, That's also and the other thing I think problem. that I found. Unfortunately funny well i know we are already over time but i just want to throw out there any more questions on our you're getting some thank yous in the chat no okay okay emma ray william sure i have a question yeah okay uh david yes uh, all the archives seem to be physical objects are there any plans to archive digital information. Uh, there are many uh, researchers that get 90% close to publishing a work and never get that last 10%. And then there are states, uh, their information disappears. Uh, do you have plans to archive digital information in the future? Well, thank you, Ray. Yeah, I mean, I do try and collect that sort of thing. I have a, a place on our server where I have an archival uh folders and um the kinds of things that you describe are would be fantastic um in fact they're much easier for us to store as you can imagine i'm looking out at the library and i have all kinds of physical boxes that i have no place to put but the um digital materials uh, we'd be very happy to acquire as you say the kinds of things where somebody uh wasn't unable to complete their work um, and it never gets formally published would be something that we would be um, very happy to receive, for sure. Did you have anything in particular in mind? Do you know of anything like this? Uh, I, I, yes, I do. <laughs> okay. But uh, we can talk, and then I have some archival uh, historical documents here that someday I'll need to talk to you and Jesse about. But, sure. Uh, yeah, it was on my mind that, uh, you know, when I go, there's a lot of miscellaneous stuff uh, mm -hmm. in my computer, nothing of great value. Right. You know, but somebody 100 years from now would wonder, well, what was colonial numismatics like back then? And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm just talking off the top of my head there. Yeah. 
No, it's great. And I mean, I, I encourage, we, I talked about the Sandem scrapbook. Um, you know, I encourage anybody to think about what, uh, we're always open to these sorts of donations. Very pleased to receive those sorts of things. I see another question, I believe here. I noticed on the letterhead with a photo that the sender was a member of my home club, the Pacific Coast Numismatic Society, even though he lived on the East Coast. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that was uh, Levy. Um, yeah, he, he listed all of his affiliations there on his letterhead. All right. Any other well, thank you, David, for hosting our 200th long table. My I mean, pleasure. Virtual round of applause for that alone. Thank um, you.